Hello and welcome to the Gestalten Podcast. My name is Martin Groschwald and as always, I'm your host of this tiny little show about mobility design. And before we start and introduce our guest, um, I wanted to say a quick sorry that you have waited for such a long time for this new episode. It's been a very busy time for us here in Munich, but um, without further ado, and I can tell you it is definitely worth the wait, I would like to introduce Karim Habib, the head of design for Kia to the Gestalten Podcast. And Karim is, of course, very well known to all of you guys. He used to run BMW. He used to work for Mercedes. He's been at Infinity, and he's now currently in Korea leading the Kia design team. And we talked in very much detail about culture and design in all aspects and all facets. So without further ado, let's go. Karim Habib on the Gestalten Podcast. Karim Habib, welcome to the Gestalten Podcast. It's a pleasure to have you on board for this lovely little episode. And a very warm welcome to you being in Korea. How are things? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Everything was good. Everything's fine. Thank you. Good. Let's jump straight into that. We sure. uh, have loads to talk about, of course. <laughs> But uh, right. before we jump into our planned topic, which is we will be talking a lot about culture and yeah. uh, culture and design and all these things. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you something up front that I ask pretty much anybody. So um, you know, to all of our normal listeners and regular listeners, they will know the question coming up. But what is good design to you, Karim Habib? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, obviously I've, I've given this a lot of thought. And uh, a good design for me actually has evolved over the years. Um, and that's... I imagine it still will evolve um, because it, I think it has a lot to do with the type of design you're doing or basically the context for which you are designing. And, you know, I can say right now that for me, my understanding of, of doing my job well, doing good design is to, to improve people's lives, to improve their lives through the objects that we are creating, well, the objects and the experiences that we're creating. So, um, yeah, I think if we do our job well, uh, we're creating positive experiences for the users, for the people who are uh, using the products that we do. And it can be, um, you know, usability, a, you know, practical way, comfortable way, safe way of doing something that improves people's lives, but also an emotional um, an emotional positive experience, uh, like seeing something beautiful, I think actually improves people's lives as well. You mentioned something just now in this definition to you and, you know, what you, what you believe in, mm -hmm. and this is experience. And when we talk about culture, and this is not just in design, this is in general, the, experience factor of a culture is something that we will all remember. I think we've all been on holidays where it wasn't just about the language, but there were so many things that kind of came in together in sure. this, in this you know, idea of an experience, of course. So when we, you know, look at this and looking into environmental changes that you, for example, had as well, I mean, you started off in Lebanon, uh, Canada, US, Germany, Japan, now you're in Korea. And I'm pretty sure you've traveled many, many countries, um, both professionally and, uh, and personally. Mm -hmm. How important is it to you, besides understanding your company, the design language, the changes that go through a design language and the brand you work for, to personally and also expect from your team to immerse yourself into local culture? This may be languages, habits, everything that goes to that to, to make these products come alive. Mm -hmm. There's kind of a fundamental question as well, you know, how, how you see life and how you see change, right? What what change can bring to you as an individual and maybe as an organization? Um, you know, any kind of any kind of uh, cultural shift, you know, whether it's within an organization or within a country or a culture that changes itself, or where you move from culture to culture. Um, there's a change involved and 
you know, embracing that change, learning from that change, um, trying to soak in to understand as much as possible from that change of environment, that change of context, that change of culture around you, I think is, a, is an enrichment. You know, I think uh, um, whatever you choose to do out of that or however you see those different things, to be able to know them, to understand them, um, I think just makes you a, you know, it gives you more choice. I don't want to say it makes you smarter because, okay, that's for each person to decide for themselves, but um, it it just gives you so many more possibilities to see things. And that's the great thing is you can see things from many different perspectives. You know, that's, that's the, that's the richness of, of let's say diversity. Right? So if you kind of try and, and uh, take that diversity within yourself through cultural understanding or different uh, understanding of cultures, I think that's extremely enriching. Do you think you can become too immersed with everything like that? I mean, you know, um, you personally lived in Germany for, for, for quite a long time and we always joke yeah. about the fact of the lederhosen and all these kind of things, you know, yeah, sure, <laughs> when, sure. you know in the Oktoberfest yeah. uh, coming back to Munich for you in that kind of context. Right. But do you, do you think with all the benefits and the challenges that go within changing the culture is that at some point you can become too immersed into it and then it's a kind of personal question of changing again or maybe accepting that you, you're now part of this culture and you, you enjoy it as well? Well, you know, that that's, I mean, that's, that's a, that's a pretty philosophical question here you're asking, you know, it's, uh, um, yeah, no, I never got the little hosen, but okay, <laughs> there's still time. Um, but, um, no, I don't think so. You know, I think it's, it's really up to, it's really up to you. You know, I, I, I felt so comfortable living in Germany. I really, in the end, felt like Munich was my hometown in, in certain ways, right? And, uh, and that's a great position to be in, right? You have, you just, it's nice to be comfortable in one place, right? It's nice to know um, the streets in, in one city and to know the people when you go to that market and so on. That's just a wonderful thing. That's a quality of life. Mm. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, there's not only that, right? So again, it's a matter of choice. If you want to do it and that's enough, and in many cases, it, it probably is enough. Um, that's fine. But if you want to be able to, um, to, you know, put yourself in a, in a less comfortable position and, and see what happens, uh, that's also fine. Yeah. That's, that's maybe the choice that I made. Maybe I made it a bit too many times in my life, but, but that's also, I think, what, uh, what helped me be the, the person that I am, whatever that is as well. <laughs> well, I think, you know, this is, uh, this is then a question to, to answer maybe in 10, 15 years time, you know, maybe right. when at some point you were, you, you decide to retire and we will have another conversation about this. Um, sure. but I'm up for that. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Me too. And, uh, <laughs> but let's, let's take this, this, yeah. this conversation a little bit into your mm -hmm. everyday job. Because mm -hmm. we, we see all these changes right now happening. Um, and a perfect example for me is that Kia recently dropped the motors out of the, right. the name. Right. So it's only Kia now. Um, so we're talking about new mobility. We're talking about a new mobility world, uh, a new right. interconnected world, of course. So um, I throw something out there and I say just like, you know, mm -hmm. culture also means understanding the past to create the future. Right. Yeah? So... If we, if we adjust that, or like, you know, put that into this new mobility context, um, how can we combine this understanding of culture and design that we have to create this new mobility world? Um, it even brings in the question, do we have to look back to create this or should it, should we be starting from a new slate? Um, and this one, and if not, like how, how important is actually a brand culture to, to push this forward? I mean, this is obviously a lot that comes into one thing, but I, I believe to, to push for these kind of new mobility worlds and solutions, the culture is a very important factor. And I, it mm -hmm. almost seems to me that it cannot be global anymore because we have to think a little bit more local to, 
adjust to different kind of cultures because you, you know, I mean, you know, who, who better to ask than you? But the German culture is very different from a Korean or an American culture, as an example. Right. Well, I mean, the, 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 really, there's m multiple levels to your question. I don't know if I can really fully answer it, but um, uh, okay. I mean, the, the past, you know. I can say that when I was when I was studying um, at Art Center, I, I was not very knowledgeable about history of cars, mm. and I didn't try at the time to really learn. Although I just loved going to you know obviously things like Pebble Beach and, and so on, and car meets and all that. But it wasn't like I really felt I needed to know everything about cars in the past and which design happened when, and so on and so forth. Um, which was maybe a little bit of an arrogance of youth, you know, because in the end, um, and my reasoning was, okay, I'm, I'm here to create the future. That might not be so important, but that's not entirely correct, I think, because you, and, and you know, there's probably a lot of examples in, in history that if you don't know history, you, you, you know, you might repeat it, uh, although, you know, inadvertent, inadvertently and make mistakes that have been made in the past. And that's basically the bottom line. I think the more you know, the more experience you have, the more you know about cultures and history of cultures, um, the more you have the choice, right? The more you can decide to follow certain things or the more you can consciously decide to break with some things from the past. So it is, it's knowledge, right? And knowing about history mm. is knowledge. And refusing knowledge just seems like a, um, like a missed opportunity to me. So in that sense, yeah, I definitely think history is very important. Now, is the history of a brand a guarantee that there's a future? I don't think so. I think there's many examples of, of that not happening. But on the other hand, it's a great asset to have. If you manage that asset, that is your history very well, or well, uh, it can help you in the future. Right? So, um, so yeah, I, I don't know if that, that answers your question or part of it, but, mm -hmm. but definitely, you know, uh, uh, culture and history is very important. But maybe uh, it's not as important as what you decide you're going to do with it for the future. No, and I think you you mentioned something important. I think it's it's obviously a little bit of a um, open ended question because I think we could have essays and right. you know lectures about this for hours and hours and hours. Sure. And I think everybody has their own opinion of what is uh, is happening. But I think it's it's just important to be open minded because if we look what's happening in the world, literally everywhere right now, you know, we have startups, we have established companies, we have sure. uh, mixes of culture coming in together and trying to figure out something new or like, you know, trying to figure out the future. Yeah. Um, it's important to, to bring those everything together. I think there is no, uh, you know, recipe that works for all. Um, right. and I think this is where, um, it's a little bit of something for me is like, you know, if we, if we take this a little bit further and also for teams as well, is the idea of, um, the mix is, is, is what makes it in the end. You know, I think we see studios, um, globally mm. having people from literally all over the world. Um, I, I don't know one studio that only has one nationality, you know, it's almost like, oh yeah, we have 15, we have 20 different kind of nationalities. And, and I think, you know, it's, it's a very big task to kind of streamline all of these things together to to build one idea out of it. And if this idea is more influenced by local culture or global culture, I mean, it's a question of uh, how it's being handled uh, in the end, you know, and how 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 the result is being um, managed and and led uh, towards what the future can be. And do we have proper answers to that right now? I I, I would probably say no, not yet. No, I, I think uh, yeah, I would agree with you. I mean, you know, whether we're talking about sort of richness and diversity in, in culture and studio, or um, you know, in sort of uh, history versus um, you know, present and, and future, or in kind of you know, if you compare startups to 
established companies in, in processes, right? If, if, if there's some uh, historical processes and we keep repeating them just because that's what they were and they have worked, um, there's a certain guarantee of success. But, um, you know, in times that require different, uh, uh, different solutions, different results, changing the process, uh, you know, can be a, a, a great enabler for a different result. So, again, it's, yeah, it's, it's variety, it's, uh, it's, let's say, richness and diversity. But at the same time, I think it's, it's just trying to be very clear in your head about mm. what you have as assets and what can become liabilities. Uh, so I think that's, that's our job, you know, uh, uh, to really try and, and filter through that stuff and try and step back and say, look, this is what I've had. This is what I've been doing. Um, this is what I want to keep. This is what I want to change. This is what I want to throw away. And maybe these are the things I just want to go all out and try them and maybe fail a few times until you establish a new path, uh, a new way of doing things that mm. then might be more compelling or more relevant for the, for the future. That's an, a very interesting point. And I, wanna, I want to push this a little bit further because you've mentioned, obviously, this idea of failing um, mm. a little bit as well. And without going too much into that, because I think we all know that from failure comes a, comes a learning as well. Sure. But if we, if we look into your position right now, which is a global role. Yeah. So Kia is not only just a local company anymore. It really is a fundamentally global company. Um, mm -hmm. do you, do you, do you think with everything that you're seeing right now, the idea of what we used to have maybe 10, 15 years ago of this idea of a global car still yeah. exists or do we need to understand the local? culture, the local requirements, and this is the customer requirements, the local customer experiences um, to adapt towards the products as well? Or is there still the opportunity to become, let's say, a, a global product, but maybe a global product based on, glo and on local experience so that only smaller things will change? Because um, with this kind of way that we're having right now of globalization, you also see that more and more people are more proud of the culture. We have currently the, the Euros ongoing. So I see, you know, walking through Munich, a lot of flags again and all those kind of things. So do, do you think there, there is a shift towards maybe more locality or is it still global or what is your impression right now when it comes to that? I mean, that's a, that's a very difficult, uh, very difficult question, honestly. At the, at the cultural level, you know, it's very different in different parts of the world, right? Um, you know, even the, 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 the concept of failure, you know, just to, to start with that again, uh, failure is perceived very differently in very different cultures, right? Um, um, you know, talking about the startup culture where failure is something to be, to be proud of, and then in more traditional cultures where failure is something to be ashamed of. So th these are things that, um, you know, obviously, uh, influence the, the fiber of a local culture. And to get to that point, um, I think I would add the, the, the you know, the, the level of, or the factor of brand, right? For global brands, um, there's global brands, you know, that are, you know, that have a very strong brand image that wherever you are in the world, they will go to that brand because that brand represents something. And so the customers seek out a certain set of values that that brand communicates and emanates. There's global brands that do very different products for their very different parts of the world. And people go to those brands, not necessarily for those precise brand values, but because they know that that product will give them or that brand will give them the product that they want. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important factor when we talk about global brands is what makes that brand global, right? Um, and, um, you know, in the case of Kia, for us, what's fascinating is I'm here at a time where things are completely shifting from maybe something that is a bit 
that was more focused on just giving exactly what the customers want in different parts of the world to something that's trying to become more, okay, what is our set of values? What do we stand for? What are our principles? What, what, why are we here as a brand? And what products do we do to, you know, to, to, to mirror those set of values? And how do we make that relevant for people in, uh, in Korea and for people in California and for people in Germany? Um, and then, okay, once you have those common denominators or common values uh, within the product that mirror, again, the brand values, then you have to go in and really focus on the customer. What does he or she want in those different p- parts of the world, right? Uh, you know, the, the, the sort of, um, you know, the, the, the customer obsession that we read about, about Amazon and how they became and what they are through that just, you know, relentless um, trying to understand the customer. That is what ha- has changed business dramatically, right, over the last mm. 10 years. And I, and I do think that that's what the car industry is going through now. It's interesting that you mention something like Amazon, because yeah. I, um, I have to say, I'm, I'm talking to a lot of people. And whenever we talk about companies like Amazon, it's like, yeah, but they're not comparable to the car industry. And I think what happens nowadays is we talk more and more about designing experiences rather than designing products. Mm-hmm. And as soon as you start talking about designing experience where the the product itself would, can be a car, it can be a watch, what, whatever you, whatever it could be, it could be a hotel, you know, what, whatever you think of, um, you know, it, it, it is, it is something that can be adjusted to local markets, but it always stands for something, you know? Right. So if you go wherever you go in the world, people understand what Amazon, for example, is. And I right. think this is the biggest challenge for, for, for the mobility sector is just to say like, look, it's not just about the product anymore, but it's about an experience. And if I, if we think about the idea of subscription models and I have a global subscription model, I can go to uh, California, Munich and Korea, and I can, let's say, rent a Kia over there. And my experience is always the same, or it's always the same feeling, put it that way to bring the, the emotion in there. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, that's where it becomes interesting. And I think, you know, this is for me the big question behind it, because if you, if you look into car companies in general, it's just to say like, how local do they have to become and experiences? How local do they have to become? Not just in terms of language, but in terms of habits, in terms of how people behave, um, of course. So, so it almost seems like, you know, when we talk about design nowadays, it's a behavioral exercise almost. And then we say just like, okay, what do we do to build a product based on that? Um, Do, do you think there, there is a shift towards that, that there's much more the question being asked at the moment in the process of uh, designing a product of why and not just who for? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I mean, there's such a great author of, of, of cars out there. Right? Uh, there's many manufacturers all over the world who build really good cars. Mm-hmm. So, so why should he or she come to to us and that's that's the question we have to ask ourselves um what can we do uh that makes us stand out but makes us stand out for a good reason and for a positive reason for a life improvement reason and uh, um yeah i mean you know that's that's part of the really exciting thing about being a designer right now is i do think our role is is changing, you know, uh, as much as, you know, I just, I love me just looking at a model, a clay model being built or when you put Dynock on it and you see the shapes and these reflections, that's still for me the, you know, the aha moment. It's still the highlight of everything I do, but I love the fact that we are now being challenged to be, to be more strategical thinkers, to be more kind of integrators of, of experiences, you know, and, uh, and that's why this question, you know, as you mentioned, the why is so much more important. And we are the ones who are being 
um, asked to ask ourselves that question. We're not the only ones, obviously, but uh, I mean, within the company structure. But we are we're at, at the core of the, the people that have to answer that question before we decide to to put a few billions to produce a car. You know? mm. So yeah, and it's it's it, obviously you know we we go into something right now which I find very interesting, and I, I don't quite want to stop just yet on this one. Okay. With this shift happening for you right now, when we talk about more about the why. Um, how difficult, how easy, how challenging is it for you as a leader to get your people, and I'm not just talking about your designers, but also your, your fellow peers, um, mm-hmm. you know, higher levels on that, that work parallel to you to, to buy into such a new thinking, uh, because it's quite, it's so new for a, mm-hmm. let's call it a more traditional industry as the car industry to start thinking more about the why, because there has been this kind of uh, attitude for many companies uh, to say, Here, here's the car, please buy it now. We think it's the right offer for you. Uh, whereas asking the question of why is a little bit different uh, in that sense. Yeah. So how, how do you get the people to buy into that? Because that's, that's changing the, the team culture, the company culture quite radically. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that that's uh, that's that's obviously again a very good question, uh, and and that's the core of the I guess our job, now, as you say, uh, uh, um, in design and and let's say the role of a, of a of a design leader or whatever my job is, but to 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 catalyze that shift, right? That that's what what I think what you need to do mostly. And, um, but, you know, the, the good thing is, I mean, the writing is on the wall, right? Everybody knows in the car industry that that's what we have to do. Um, our product to become, to, to not to become, to stay relevant and to stay, uh, uh, you know, for us to be able to provide that mobility that really I believe is essential to, to human evolution, right? To human progress, we have to change the way we do it, mm-hmm. and uh, we're not the only ones to know that. Many people in the company know that. Um, and you know, for us, if I if I can talk about Hyundai, Kia, the the, the group, what's interesting is that we have a, a you know a, a chairman who's new in his uh, position, um, who is very very conscious of that. Um, and who keeps pushing that quite radically. And, uh, and we in designer are here to, to help him in that sense, you know, to, to accelerate that process. So, um, you know, it's very challenging, but at the same time, it's just really rewarding. Even the small steps that happen every day are just, in the end, I think that's what most designers are in it for, right? To be able to see that that difference that we make for, for a good reason, for, for a good cause, if I may say so. Yeah. How would you define yourself and your role right now? Because you mentioned something funny just now and said like, oh, whatever my role is <laughs> uh, or whatever it's being said. Yeah. Um, would you consider yourself? And I, and I asked, um, Benoit Jacob this when we did the podcast and uh, and, I, and I think it's a very interesting question. It's like, do you, do you still consider yourself as more of a a, 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 a car designer or as a experienced designer? Because, you know, uh, there will be a follow up question to this one because we see so much social media influence right, right now and so much, you know, visual input on this one right now. Uh, do you see yourself in a different kind of role? And do you think this idea of a traditional car designer is is currently changing fundamentally that it's not maybe necessarily just about, you know, the great sketch or like, you know, the, the great sculpture that it's actually much more than that right now. Oh, definitely. It, it is much more than that. Uh, but it doesn't negate all of that. And that's the important mm-hmm. thing is that it is more than it maybe was in the past, but still, if you don't do your homework, which it is, you know, to, I still think, you know, to create beautiful, compelling products, 
um, then you you haven't done the base, right? The foundation of it. So um, I think it is all that and more. So yes, it is experience. It is, uh, you know, uh, usability. Um, it is interaction. Um, but but still, you know, the rest has to work, you know. Yeah. Um, ergonomics, safety. Um, I don't know what to call it, aesthetics or beauty or uh, however you want to define that. But, you know, the just the visual appeal of an object and maybe it's maybe it's not just visual, it's visual, it's spatial, it's tactile, it's mm. it's sound, it's light, it's all those things that remains at the core of what we do. But uh, a lot of people do that very well. And, and customers know that. So uh, we need to understand maybe more of sort of what's in between the lines that can, again, hopefully make their, their lives better. So in that sense, yeah, that, that's that's why I say that, because I, I do think our role uh, changes really uh, uh, quite a lot. And it's, it's, I think it's just the beginning of that, that shift. Yeah. And, and, you know, what I, what I want to follow up on this one is, of course, when I mentioned the social media is, and I know you're on Instagram as well. Yeah. And there's so many great, let's call them styling proposals out there. You know, people in their spare time, uh, students showing what they can do nowadays. Um, and, and, and I, and I sometimes believe, and or like when I look at those kind of things is to say, are we, are we pushing maybe those kind of guys to share their ideas, but then it becomes a bit more styling? How, what can we do to actually, you know, show what what is required nowadays? Because with all these new influences, it's not just about the nice sketch or like a perfect sketch. Of course, this is an important factor to start off somewhere. But putting that into context, we're talking a lot about storytelling. Of course, at the moment, there's um, quite a lot of interesting learnings from the from the film and entertainment industry about experience and building that um but but i sometimes have the feeling with all this kind of overflow of styling proposals on instagram it, it might get lost a little bit to understand you know our cultural surroundings and you know where, where studio shifts to towards right now and uh, i i i just find that very almost like counterproductive you know, it's like you have what happens in the companies and then you see what happens outside. And it's like, maybe we should bring this a little bit together to get also like the people starting to think a little bit more um, from time to time. Yeah, that, that's again, I think a difficult one because it's, uh, um, it, you know, it, both are necessary, right? I mean, um, okay, let me, let me give you an example, right? When I went to, to art center, which is the mid nineties. It's a long time ago. Uh, <laughs> there was before my time, there was somebody called Nick Pugh that had graduated. For those my generation, you might still remember him. He was a, like a genius entertainment designer, car designer, but done just, I mean, he was just fantastic. He did things that broke the mold at every level. And um, he, you know, started doing fractal design in the 90s, right? So, which was something completely unheard of. And uh, he had then a few, whatever, a decade later, he built his car. He presented at an art center and I was there. I'd been, and, and he said, ah, you know, doing cool sketches, lots of people can do that. But building a car, that's the real stuff. And of course, he was referring to his accomplishment of having built it. And he's right. Of course, he's right. But... It doesn't mean that actually doing great sketches or doing great models is, is something to, uh, to dismiss, right? All these kids on Instagram who do these amazing things, they do amazing things. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, maybe that's just not enough, right? Uh, but it's, it's okay if it lives in its own world and you let it be that excellent thing that it is in that environment. Um, and then you put it aside and then you have to address the problem completely differently when you do build something in a brand with whatever restrictions that your reality context gives you. So um, I don't want to dismiss it or negate it as something easy because it isn't, 
And, mm. uh, you know, there's a lot of very talented people out there. Uh, but yeah, okay, the, the, the reality is different. Um, and if you're able to use those skills or that talent that you have and to make them that reality that much more, let's say, or to, to, to be able to create within a different context and a reality, that's a different thing. So one doesn't guarantee the other, but one shouldn't negate the other either. Yeah. Yeah. So to finish, finish the, the conversation off a little bit and no worries, you will get the three questions that every guest gets on the podcast as well <laughs> okay. towards the end. But, um, sure. um, how do you, you as a leader, as a manager, as a, you know, per person who's supposed to give direction into not just a company, but a team, uh, a creative kind of it, encourage your, 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 your team members, your colleagues, leagues to to get out of their comfort zone to think differently what what is it that if you know there's a lot of people obviously listen to the podcast students and so on and so on but also relatively high level uh, vps and all these levels what, how would you encourage them to think differently what is what is your tip of just to say like this this is what i from personal experience i've learned and this is what i would give to everybody when i can um the first thing that comes to mind is failure. Uh, again, to get back to that point, uh, maybe it's nice to start and to finish the conversation with that. But uh, <laughs> failure is a failure is a good thing. Um, um, you know, of course, you have to be able to get back up, which is not always easy. But um, you have to, I think, create the environment that makes your team members comfortable with failure. You know, they, they need to know that they're going to do 95% of crap sketches, right? Mm -hmm. And and if they do, then they're doing things right because they're they're pushing the boundaries, they're questioning themselves, they're they're not just doing the you know, what's defending. They're not just doing what can please people quickly. Mm -hmm. um, because that's not the point. Again, there's a lot of people who can do that. But, um, yeah, to question things, to push the, the boundaries, you have to test those boundaries. And to test those boundaries, you have to step over it. Once you step over it and you feel that, whatever that pain is, once you've stepped over it, then you realize, okay, I've reached that boundary. So where is that kind of that that limit that I can tread and be exactly on the right spot. So, yeah, that, that's, I guess, you know, one of the ways. There's many ways, right? One of the ways, again, yeah. is to, to, to encourage or to make people feel like they can come back from failure without mm. any uh, disadvantage, quite the contrary, to come back with a lot of learning from it. I, it's important for me, for my team, and it's very important for me, to be honest, as a, as a father of, of two still young girls, right? I need them to understand that. And it's tough. It's tough for kids to, to feel that as well. Right? Um, so, yeah. Sorry, little personal twist here. <laughs> no, but, yeah. and, and I appreciate that very much, Karim, because I think, um, you know, it's, we're currently living in a culture and my, my colleague Daniel calls it the, uh, the millionaire culture because on mm. social media, everybody looks like a millionaire, right. <laughs> like a billionaire. Right. Um, and, and it looks like, you know, there is not necessarily a lot of failure allowed because social media, and this is what's represented, uh, you know, in the outside world and in the big global world, um, yeah. it's, it's, it's almost not present anymore. Um, and I think, it's important to, to encourage that because, you know, if, if we, if we just follow what's happening on those kind of social media trends, uh, we, we will get stuck at some point, um, in that sense, because if we're not allowed to, to fail, then we're not allowed to grow. And I think it's very important that you've, that you've said this because it's, it's, it's also a very dangerous uh, way of looking into things if failure is not accepted. Um, you yeah, know, of course. How else can you learn, right? Mm. Exactly, exactly. But uh, Karim, thank you very much. That was a lovely conversation. But before I let you go, as always, three mm -hmm. questions. Okay. Everyone gets them. 
Uh, yeah. and, we start off, <laughs> and we start off uh, question number one, which mm-hmm. creative mind, and this can be anybody, this doesn't need to be okay. anybody, car industry, literally anybody, um, has inspired you the most in both your career and personal life? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough one again. <laughs> I don't know why I agreed to this podcast. You only have tough questions. <laughs> um, well, there, you know, again, there's personal things and there's, there's professional things. You know, I've, I've been lucky to have, uh, to have bosses and colleagues that have, uh, that have been just really impressed by, you know, uh, of course, not everyone, but, uh, you know, that happens. Um, you know, again, maybe the personal note. I have uh, my brother is uh, nine years older than me. Who's I've had I've always looked up to him very, very much. Because my brother, I think, comes from another planet. But um, um, yeah, my brother he teaches uh, finance, but he's he's so principled. He's so uncompromising on his principles. Um, you know, they have a lot to do with sort of humanity and generosity and things like that, that he just, uh, he completely threw me off in all my teenage years when I didn't know how to be a normal teenager. Um, yeah, so uh, he's definitely a, kind of a strong, uh, strong person in, in my life. Um, but, you know, also people... I guess if I name them, I have to name so many people. You know, I've had <laughs> uh, Chris Bangle, who obviously gave me my, obviously he gave me my first job, who uh, was really exemplary as a, as a boss, somebody who had, you know, a lot of pressure in his most difficult times that never, never let it trickle down to us. He mm-hmm. took everything upon himself. So I think that's actually really commendable. Um, Thomas Blatt, which maybe not many people know, uh, always a long time at BMW, who all same kind of mentality, always extremely supportive of his team. So, um, yeah, these, these kind of people are just very human, you know, very mm-hmm. driven, uh, very principled, but at the same time, very human. And, and uh, I think that's something um, to really look up to. Question number two, and again, this doesn't need to be a car project, can be anything. Um, which project you have not been part of would you have absolutely loved to participate in? I didn't get it since after, now I forgot. <laughs> um, well, you know. Yeah, I, I just, I, I guess it's, it's hard. Uh, I'm going to stick to cars because obviously that's the thing I know best. But, uh, I don't know. I just, I would have loved to be like, uh, Gandini's assistant in the, in the sixties and seventies and just <laughs> do the drawings next to him, you know, and kind of, uh, you know, been there for the Stratos or for the Kunta or, you know, just, Touch. I don't, never knew how to pronounce it, but yeah, it's uh, um, that. That's just the golden era, right? Where the future was, the future was only fantastic, yeah. and uh, I just would have loved to, to be there. Cool. And last but certainly not least, here comes the car question. Yeah. If I give you a blank check, which car would you buy? Yeah, that one's almost impossible for me to answer because, <laughs> because there's so many. I, you know, I again, it's kind of you know betrays sort of my my. my it's related to to Gandini in that era. I mean, there's just so many wonderful cars. You know, in Italy, obviously, in the '60s and '70s, and and uh, I would totally be there. Um, but it, it varies uh, very, very often, you know, but uh, yeah, maybe, uh, maybe the first, you know, the, the prototype of the, the Kuntach that was burnt down, you know, where I believe it, it did burn down, but that just super minimalist, clear initial Kuntach was such an amazing, amazing thing, right? Or, 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 or a Stratos, uh, even yeah. fully loaded. 
loaded rally stratos i would also not mind having that <laughs> who would yeah exactly <laughs> karim right. thank you very much yeah, Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate that. Um, you taking the time out of your day and, uh, it was a lovely conversation. I think it was something that, uh, uh, to be very fair, only very few people, uh, are capable of discussing in so much detail. And I really do appreciate your honesty and your openness in the conversation. So, uh, yeah. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It was, it was also equally pleasurable. It's not a bit tough for me, but no, thank you. Yeah, it was great. Thanks a lot. But, you know, this, this is the nice thing. We're not, we're not the kind of normal media where you always have to talk about the cars. We want to make it a little bit more challenging. <laughs> right. No, that was great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Karim. And to all of our listeners as well, thank you once again for listening into the Gestalten podcast. And we will be back very shortly with our next guest and our next episode. Thank you very much and bye-bye. Great. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.